I would like to review some conceptual questions related to stress and strain transformation, specifically those that could be answered easily by understanding the concept of more circle. Um, the very first question is the one that is shown here. Uh, maximum shear stress is usually a controlling factor of failure for ductile materials. Which of the following elements is the most critical element if they are made from a ductile material? So we need to detect which of these four elements would experience the maximum shear stress. None of these elements are currently uh, having any shear stress on the plane that is shown here. But we know that there will be shear stresses developed in the element if we rotate the element. But which of these four would experience the maximum shear stress? Let's try to draw the Mohr circle for the very first element, element number A. In that element, the principal stresses are sigma. Note that the element that is shown here are representing the principal plane because shear stresses are zero. So in that case, we have sigma P1 equal to sigma and sigma P2, the other principal stress, equal to sigma as well. Um, to make it more clear, I'm going to assume that sigma is, say, 15. So the first principal stress would be 15, the other one would be 15. And I'm going to show these two points in the axis here. So counting 15 grids to the right, we have this point over here. And the other point would be, again, the same. So the Mohr circle for this element is just one dot. It means that the radius of this circle is zero. And we know that the radius is the shear stress, the maximum shear stress in the element. So how much is the maximum shear stress in element A? That would be simply zero. Now let's go and talk about element B. In element B, there are the same amount of stresses, but one of them is positive, the other one is negative. It means that the principal stresses would be sigma and negative sigma. I'm going to show those stresses here. Again, assuming that we have sigma equal to 15 on one side and negative 15 on the other side, these are the points that are showing the principal stresses for element B. And now I can draw a more circle that is passing through these two points. Okay, this is the Mohr circle. The maximum shear stress in this circle would be the radius of that. In this case, if we count the number of grids, the maximum shear stress would be equal to sigma. We can do the same for the other stress elements and solve the rest of the problem. For point C, we can draw the Mohr circle in a similar way. Um, stresses in the x direction is negative sigma, say negative 15, and stress in the y direction is 0. So the Mohr circle is passing through 0 and negative 15 like this. The maximum shear stress in this element would be the radius of the circle, which would be half of sigma. Now let's look at the element D. In that case, principal stresses are uh, positive sigma in the x direction and zero in the y direction. So we can draw the more circle by, by knowing the fact that the circle is passing through zero and sigma, like this. And in that case, again, the maximum shear stress is sigma over two. So the most uh, critical element, or the element with the maximum shear stress, is element B. Next question. Which of the following built-up members requires less number of fasteners in unit length of beam? Um, this question is more related to shear stress in beams. The number of fasteners that is required for connecting a piece to the rest of the beam is controlled by the shear flow. Higher shear flow requires more fasteners to connect the pieces together. Shear flow is lowercase q, and that is determined from this equation, V capital Q over I. V is the shear force, capital Q is the first moment of area, and I is the moment of inertia. 
all of these beams are having the same final shapes. So I would be the same for all of these sections. And we assume that all of those are subjected to the same amount of uh, forces, V. So the only thing that would change here would be capital Q or the first moment of area. The first moment of area itself is determined by multiplying the area of the piece that is connected by the fasteners by distance of that, uh, the centroid of that area to the centroid of the entire section. Um, for the left section, uh, the top part is connected to the rest of the section by two fasteners. So if I want to determine the area, I'm going to consider the area of that it is hatched shaped, and D would be distance of centroid of that shape to the centroid of the entire section. For the middle one, area would be the area of the middle part that is connected by two fasteners again to the uh, side boards. So area would be smaller compared to the left section, but D is the same because the centroid is the same in these two shapes. For the last section, area would be again the area of this part, which is connected by again two fasteners to the rest of the section, and D is the same. So the one that has the smallest area would give us the smallest first moment of area or Q, which in turn give us smallest shear flow. And that requires less number of fasteners for connection. So the answer would be this one, the middle beam. A ceramic cube is placed on the bottom of a swimming pool with depth of H. If density of water is gamma sub W, what is the maximum absolute shear stress in the ceramic cube? This question again requires understanding and using the concept of Mohr circle. First of all, let's see what are stresses that are acting on that cube. We know that pressure in water increases linearly by depth. So I can show that pressure by a triangle like this. The maximum stress would be at the bottom of this pool and that would be gamma w multiplied by h. This is the maximum pressure that we would expect to develop uh, in that ceramic cube. Now let me take out that ceramic cube and show the stresses that are developed on the side of that element. Pressure or stress in the horizontal direction would be the same on two sides. And on each side, we have gamma w multiplied by h. The same amount of stress is going to develop on top of this element. So gamma w multiplied by h. By the way, um, stress on top of this element would be a little bit smaller than stress on the bottom of this cube or element because of the height of that element. But assuming that that cube is small compared to the height of the pool, we can assume that the same amount of stress is acting on the top and on the bottom of the ceramic cube. Now let's determine how much is the maximum absolute shear stress in this cube. To do that, we need to draw the Mohr circle. In the horizontal direction, we draw the normal stress or sigma and in the vertical direction we show the shear stress or ta. This stress element is the principal plane because there is no shear stress directly developed on that plane. So the magnitude of stresses are principal stresses. If I want to draw the more circle I can simply consider these stresses as the principal stresses. So in the x direction, we have negative gamma w multiplied by h. For the vertical direction, again, we would have negative gamma w by h. So the other principal stress would be at the same point. This is a Mohr circle with the zero radius, and the maximum shear stress in this element would be simply zero. Note that in all stress elements, in which the principal stresses are the same, the maximum shear stress would be zero. This question is directly related to the Mohr circle. A Mohr circle is given, and the problem says if 
2 theta p is 36.86 degree it wants to determine how much is the theta s in this case. Um, before talking about the answer of this problem, let's briefly review what the information that we can get from the Mohr circle in terms of the theta s and theta p. Each stress element in a Mohr circle is shown by a pair of points. In this case, we have this point at the left and we have this point at the right. And we can determine how much our stress is on that section. Let me draw the stress element for this shape. So stress in the x direction is negative 60 on both sides and shear stress is 27 positive. So that's going to be like this. Stress on the y plane is 12 and 27. So stress on the vertical direction is 12 and the same amount of shear stress is developed on that plane. So this is the stress element that is associated with that Mohr circle. Based on this Mohr circle, we know that if you rotate this uh, stress element and clockwise by 36.86 degree as shown here, we get to the principal plane. So that would be one of the principal planes. So 2 theta p is 36.86. But the question is, how much should I rotate this element to get to the maximum shear stress? The maximum shear stress would be either the top or the bottom of the circle. So considering the bottom of the circle, I need to rotate this counterclockwise with the magnitude of 2 theta s, which in this case would be 90 degree minus 36.86, which is 53.14 degree. Note that this is 2 theta s. If I want to determine how much is theta s itself, I simply divide that by 2, which is 26.57 degree. This is the amount of rotation that we need to rotate the original element to get to the maximum shear stress. This is another question related to the Mohr circle. Um, a Mohr circle is shown for a point in a physical object that is subjected to plane stress. If one grid square is 9 megapascals, determine the maximum in plane shear stress. Um, the maximum in plane shear stress is simply the radius of the Mohr circle for the element that is shown here. So we simply go and determine what is the, what is the radius of the circle. So that one would be the maximum in plane shear stress. And let's count the number of grids. I count about eight and a half. So the maximum shear stress that we see in this case would be eight and a half multiplied by the length of each grid, which is nine megapascals. In this case, I would get 76.5 megapascal. Let's look at this problem in a little bit different way. How much would be the maximum absolute shear stress? In this case, the principal stresses are positive and negative. The one on the left side, which is shown here, let's call this sigma P2, is negative. The one that is located on the right side, let's call it sigma P1, is positive. So the maximum absolute and maximum in plane are equal to each other. In other words, if I draw the other more circles, they are going to be smaller than the circle that we see here. So the maximum in plane and the maximum absolute are equal in this case. Um, this question says more circles is shown for a point in a physical object that is subjected to a plane stress. If one grid square is 11 megapascals, determine principal stress sigma 2. 
it simply says where are the intersection of the Mohr circle with the horizontal axis calling the left intersection as sigma 2 or sigma p2 and the right intersection as sigma p1 we can determine the magnitude of each of these two stresses so i see about um, 10 say 0.7 grids to the left so sigma p2 would be 10.7 multiplied by the size of the grid which is uh, 117 Point seven megapascals. If you wanted to determine how much is the other principal stress or sigma 1, then we simply determine the intersection of the Mohr circle with the right side, which in this case would be say 2.8 grid multiplied by 11, which is 30.8 megapascals. So sigma p2 would be... There is another question in which we can use the Mohr circle to find the answer. In this case, each grid counts for 20 ksi. In other words, the length of each grid is 20 ksi. And we want to determine the angle theta p to the principal plane. Um, so we need to see how much, we, how much do we need to rotate the element to get to the principal plane. Let's consider the right point. In this case, we need to rotate this point by this angle, which we call it 2 theta p, to get to the principal plane, to the maximum stress. And we can determine how much is this angle using a triangle. So let's look at this triangle here. I'm talking about this uh, triangle. In this triangle, tangent of 2 theta p is 4 grids so that would be 4 multiplied by 20 divided by 3 grids or 3 divided multiplied by 20 this ratio is 1.33 and 2 theta p would be invert tangent of that which is 53.1 degree so theta p would be half of that number. So theta p is 26.5 degree in this case. The other question is this one, which is very simple. Which of the following equation is used for the radius of the Mohr circle? We can simply answer this question by looking at the equations, but let's try to draw the Mohr circle and understand that more conceptually. State of strain in this uh, in arbitrary element is shown by epsilon x and half of gamma xy. So let's just assume that this is the point that we have, epsilon x and half of gamma xy as, say, one side of the element. The other point would be epsilon y and half of gamma xy, which I'm assuming that this is the coordinate for the other point epsilon y and half of gamma xy for this point. To draw the Mohr circle, we need to connect these two points together. The intersection of this line with the horizontal axis shows the centroid of the Mohr circle. So the Mohr circle looks like this. The coordinate of the Mohr circle would be the average of epsilon x and epsilon y the radius of the Mohr circle would be square root of the difference between the strains like this. So that would be the radius of the Mohr circle. And the principal strains are going to be the intersection of this Mohr circle with the horizontal axis. So one of them would be this one, epsilon p1, and the other one would be the left intersection, which is epsilon p2. So the coordinate for those would be centroid plus radius and centroid minus radius. Similar to that, we can determine the maximum shear strain, which would be the radius of the circle on the top and on the bottom. 
So we can say half of gamma maximum is equal to ratio.